What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA podcast. I am your host, and my name is John. And this week is going to be a solo podcast. Ozzy had a friend getting married down in Miami and uh, had a busy week, so I wasn't able to make the recording this week. I'm sure he'll be back before UFC 272 next week, but just going to be me on this podcast analyzing the Makachev versus Green card. We got 11 fights going down from Las Vegas this Saturday. Uh, early start time, 4 p.m. Eastern time, and it should be a pretty quick card considering uh, only 11 fights. We still have the weigh-ins tomorrow. Hopefully, everyone is able to make weight. We did have one fight canceled. Hannah Goldie versus Jinyu Fry is not happening because Goldie is sick. And, um, you know, just a quick recap of last week. Uh, lost one unit on official bets, minus 1.01 units. Uh, some tough luck on a few of these. Uh, not really too many bad bets. I'd say that the Edgar Clark uh, GTD was definitely the worst bet out of them. But I don't regret Strader, Belbita, Benitez, Pierce Sub. I don't regret any of those bets. So just some unfortunate luck in some of those. Um, not necessarily a bad bet. So just going to keep grinding away. Got some more bets locked in this week already. Have a few money line bets already locked in. And I'll definitely be sharing what those are throughout the podcast. So with that being said, let's get right into the first fight, which is in the flyweight division. Uh, we got some UFC newcomers here. Uh, Carlos Hernandez taking on Victor Altamirano. Uh, Hernandez is the favorite here at minus 145 on Bet Online right now. And I think that line is pretty accurate. I see, I do think that uh, Hernandez is the better martial artist. Seeing a bit better clean technique out of him, especially in the striking. He just looks very measured. His footwork looks good. He knows what his strengths are. He has good leg kicks. Targets the inside and outside with that leg kick. Solid boxing. Knows how to pace himself over 15 minutes. And can honestly hit some good takedowns and look competent from top position at times. So I have like what I saw from Hernandez. He got a nice uh, victory on the Contender Series over Barez. A very close fight, but he did what he needed to at the right times. Rallied late in that fight in round three to win. And Altamirano kind of did the same thing. These guys had a really similar Contender Series fight where they lost round one, had a close round two, but edged it, and then rallied late in round three with their better cardio to uh, edge that split decision. I think, you know, both guys were probably the rightful winners of those fights. Um, but... What I'm seeing from Altamirano is that he is just a little bit of a crazy southpaw. He spams volume. He likes throwing those left kicks. But his technique is not very clean. Uh, he can be taken down. He's spent a lot of time on his back throughout some of his fights. And I think that that's liable to happen again here. I think Hernandez will mix in some takedowns. Should be the better wrestler, have the ability to get out to Morano on, on the ground. And uh, Victor just kind of lays on his back and goes for submissions for long periods of time. And if he can't get that submission, he'll just lay in guard for uh, three, four minutes at times. We've seen that multiple times throughout his fight. So I give Hernandez the slight advantage on the feet, but I could see Morano uh, giving him some problems with his, his volume with that left kick of his from the southpaw stands. But I give Hernandez a pretty solid advantage on the ground here as well. So I think Hernandez can cover his price. I think he's the rightful minus 150 or so favorite and i have a bet on him uh one unit at uh minus 128 odds i believe i locked that in last night uh let me check where those odds are at uh, yeah minus 128 on fanduel last night it's still available at minus 135 fanduel which is the best price out there um so newcomer fight both these guys aren't bad i think hernandez has the higher ceiling and i think i'm going to pick him to cover his price tag on his way to a decision victory here and that is going to take us to the next fight, which is in the welterweight division. We have Ramiz Brahima as the huge favorite over Michael Gilmore. Uh, Brahima minus 360, Gilmore plus 285. I have to say that I think it is crazy that Brahima is this much of a favorite in a UFC fight. I mean, they really did match him against one of the worst fighters on the roster in Gilmore. But I still don't think him being the minus 360 favorite is an appropriate price tag. And another uh, bet that is kind of mispriced here is his submission line. Um, I tweeted about this a couple days ago when it was at plus 100. It's actually down to minus 125 now. I just think it's crazy that people are betting Brahima at over 50% to get a submission. And my logic is that if Gilmore at 185 in his last fight, he is dropping down to welterweight for this fight. If he was taken down, put on bottom by Petrosky, spent six or seven minutes on bottom versus Petrosky, who's a big brown belt uh, at 185, he still didn't get submitted in that fight. It was a ground and pound finish that finished him in that one. So I'm, I'm thinking, how can you be confident in Brahima, uh, who is a purple belt welterweight, who has mostly submitted really low-level fighters? How are you over 50% confident that he's getting the sub here? I just think that's that's wrong. 
And generally, I think the betting fighters to get a finish, a knockout, a sub at plus one, whatever it is, plus 190, plus 150, is probably minus EV. I just don't think those are the right props to be betting. There are definitely better props to, to stab at out there. Like, for instance, Rami's sub, or I mean, Rami's knockout is plus 950 on FanDuel. I mean, I think the same thing could happen as the Petrosky fight, where Rami's is having trouble getting a submission, so he pounds away and tries to get a TKO. And Rami's has hurt a few guys on the feet, too, in his LFA fights. Gilmore's cutting down to 170. His chin could be weakened. So I'd rather stab on the Rami's KO prop at plus 950 than anything else on the Rami's side. But money line side wise it's definitely Gilmore a pass I mean Gilmore is a pretty bad defensive grappler but he's not hopeless on the feet he did win round two on two out of three judges scorecards versus Petrosky so I think the guy's getting a little bit better I think he is looking a uh, better than his uh, Uriba or Urbina fight from the uh, the tough this past season. I think the guy honestly could make this really competitive on the feet, maybe even win the striking against Brahima. So Brahima just got dominated against Court McGee uh, last month. Uh, you know, he might not be recovered from that beatdown that he took by uh, the veteran Court McGee in that fight. And, you know, he was he was dominated bell to bell in that one. So he, he's coming into this fight short notice. I, I do not like any bets on Brahima here except for his knockout at plus 950. Either stab on that or stab on Gilmore at the money line price. Uh, but this is just a really low level fight. Um, probably not a good fight to bet on with any sort of confidence. And that's going to take us to the next fight, which is now in the featherweight division. It was supposed to be 135, got moved up to 145. And that is uh, Jonathan Martinez as the favorite at minus 240, taking on Alejandro Perez, plus 205. I just think Martinez mostly has him covered everywhere here. Um, he's the, the better kicker, uh, the much faster fighter. Perez is just kind of a basic boxer. You know, he kind of wings an overhand, has low volume at times. He lost round one unanimously to Johnny Eduardo, the 42-year-old bantamweight in his last fight. And he was able to get a takedown and to submit Eduardo in round two of that fight. But... Uh, I don't think that he's going to be able to hit takedowns on Martinez here. Martinez's takedown defense looked really good in his last fight against uh, Zivia Lavalshvili. Um, stuffed a bunch of takedowns in that fight. Outstruck him very cleanly to a, a decision victory. Pretty much a 30-27 from Martinez there. And I just think Martinez is the much cleaner striker. That's really all I have to say. I think he's the much better kicker. He's got solid power in his hands. Um, he's a longer fighter. You're going to see Martinez stand on the outside and just kind of kicking and picking uh, Perez apart from the outside. I just don't see Perez having much success with that low volume boxing approach here. So uh, I got Martinez to probably cover his price tag. He's a pretty safe pick in this one. In terms of the props for this one, um, let me look at this one. I guess there's some slight value on the knockout prop for Martinez plus 275. I could just see him being too fast, too quick uh, at this weight class, um, but pretty appropriately priced. I don't really see anything that jumps off the page for me in this fight. So let's just move on to the next fight, which is in the lightweight division, a fight I believe I have analyzed on the podcast before uh, it got canceled uh, the day of the last time it was scheduled, and that is Ferris Zium versus Terrence McKinney. Um, we have Zium as the minus 121 favorite, McKinney plus 101, although some books, DraftKings specifically, does have this as a pick em, minus 110 on both sides, and McKinney has, you know, really high rolled his entire career. I mean, the guy has uh, had a few quick knockouts and some lower level promotions, got his way into the UFC, got the fastest knockout in lightweight history, just bonking um, Matt Frivola there in that fight. And I give the guy credit. He's high rolled his career. He seems like a cool guy. You know, he's very active on Twitter, um, you know. Seems like, again, seems like a cool guy, but I'm going to be a little bit harsh when I'm analyzing him here because I just don't think the guy's a very good fighter. I mean, what we've seen from him is fights that end quickly and inside the distance. We saw him get triangled by Derek Minner just about two years ago. Um, and if you watch his early fights, he seems to be a, a grappler, an offensive grappler. He took down Sean Woodson on the Contender Series. He got some back takes and some takedowns in that fight. But his past few fights, he's really fallen in love with his striking, fallen in love with that left head kick. But the guy just comes out so aggressive, so wild in round one. He wants that left head kick. He's fallen down to the floor throwing that left head kick. He's fallen over in the... Uh, He's getting off balance, throwing his one twos. He's just getting so, so aggressive. And I think this is just such a recipe for him coming out strong, looking to get that knockout. ZM is probably not going to get knocked out like some of his lower level opponents that McKinney has uh, faced. 
And you're going to see McKinney slow down. I mean, the guy has had two minutes of fight time in two and a half years. I mean, that that's a pretty crazy statistic alone right there. Uh, I mean, his past five fights have all ended in under 90 seconds. Um, and even if you go back before that, the guy has been in round three one time. He's never been to the decision. And I just think that has, you know, a recipe for him gassing out written all over it. Ferrazium, on the other hand, has decision wins in the UFC, um, has decision wins outside of the UFC as well although you could say that some of a lot of his fights have ended early as well but what I've seen is is pretty good cardio from him in his past two fights. You know, he did slow down. He he got rocked versus Vendermini, arguably got 10 aided and deserved to uh, have that fight scored a draw. But he did enough in the first two rounds versus Vendermini to secure the win. His takedown defense looked good against Jamie Malarkey, stuffing a lot of his takedowns. And ZM is a skilled striker. You know, former kickboxer is getting much uh, much more used to the MMA side of things making steady improvements at his young age. And I think that Ferris Ziem is just a better overall mixed martial artist. I think his takedown defense is plenty good enough to stuff takedowns if McKinney chooses to wrestle. And I think he is smart enough of a striker to avoid that early, early knockout. I mean, like I said, Ziem, former kickboxer, I mean, this guy is not going to be phased at all by McKinney trying to bum rush him and head kick him in, in 30 seconds. I just think he's going to be adequately prepared to avoid that McKinney rush. And if this fight goes past a few minutes, it should be all Zium. I mean, if it gets into round two, it really should be heavily, heavily favored towards Ferris Zium. So in terms of a pre-fight bet, I mean, I think Zium is still the side. If you're taking McKinney, I would probably just take that round one knockout prop or nothing um, because I just he hasn't proved anything that he can win this fight outside of a quick knockout. I mean, all of his skills, all of his fights, I don't think translate well to this matchup outside of just bonking Zium in the first uh, 60, 90 seconds like he's done to his past few opponents. So McKinney, round one knockout or bust. Uh, I think that if you're taking him, like I said, take that prop, take the knockout prop. And ZM, I think, is the pre fight side. I'd say maybe go with a small bet on ZM before the fight and then look to just add more in that live line. Be really looking closely at that live betting line and looking to get in at the right time on ZM because, I mean, he could, like I said, look like a huge, huge favorite in rounds two and three. Might even find a finish in rounds two and three at some point here. So, what are those ZM late, not, uh, late round? props because those could have some value zm round two plus 750 round three plus 1100 yeah those are good so maybe some stabs in those later rounds and i'm picking zm to avoid the early storm and to you know use his experience to drown out mckinney late here uh, but very fun matchup uh moving things on to the women's featherweight division uh, a short notice fight here josiah nunez taking on ramona pasquale uh Nunez minus 205, Pasquale plus 175 on Bet Online. So, not a whole lot of footage on Pasquale. I do have to give that disclaimer here. Um, her past three fights have her been just smashing her opponents, really low level opponents that she just ran through without any um, problems at all. Um, all those fights ending in under three minutes. And, you know, she does look like, uh, you know, a, a big woman. She does fill out this 145 pound weight class pretty well, probably better than Nunez, who is a very short, stocky woman. Um, but Nunez, you know, throws hammers. You saw that in her UFC debut against Maleki. She comes forward nonstop. She spams punches. She'll, um, you know, get you into the clinch a little bit, maybe try to hit you with some left hand, some overhand lefts coming off of the break. And, you know, she's just a... Uh, a fucking wrecking ball. That's the only way to describe her. She comes forward nonstop. She looks durable. She had a few big strikes from Maleki, and then she eventually floored Maleki uh, with that left hand. And I don't know if you guys have kn known this, but Bay Maleki has had like a concussion for like four months straight since that fight has happened. Like she's posted on Instagram saying that like her brain is, is like severely messed up from that fight, and she's having to do all types of rehab. I mean, that's just how hard uh, Nunes hit. She is, you know. A real knockout puncher in these women's divisions um but you know i could see that pasquale's style being a bit of a problem for her pasquale's style is coming from a muay thai background she likes to march into the clinch throw some knees um you know her her boxing does look pretty sloppy it looks like she can be caught with some punches coming into that clinch but pasquale if she can get into that clinch if she can start landing some knees maybe slow the gas tank down of nunez um 
it's just getting close with Nunez. So Nunez doesn't have that ideal boxing range where she can land those big punches. I think that's a good game plan from Pasquale. So um, she's definitely going to have to look out for those punches coming in to the clinch. She could get caught. She could get rocked on her way into the clinch. But once she gets into the clinch, I think her physical size and the, those knees and elbows that I've seen from her could, you know, give her some good advantages here against Nunez. So I just think you can't be laying minus 200 on Nunez. I mean, I know Pascual is a newcomer. She has very little footage, uh, never fought in the UFC. But Nunez, only one fight in the UFC. Uh, let's not get crazy here, backing her at minus 200. Another crazy line here is this fight ending inside the distance is priced at minus 200, minus 250 across the board. I mean, for a women's fight to be priced like that, I mean, that's pretty fucking crazy, especially with these women that are so inexperienced. So I think a stab on the goes the distance at plus 200. I mean, you really can't be too wrong at a women's fight to go the distance at plus 200. So I like Pasquale's chances here. I think it's money line, uh, dog or pass situation, definitely. Um, I mean, you got to take a bit of a shot in the dark in this fight, but if you want to gamble a little bit, maybe take some uh, some Pasquale money line action or something, uh, or that goes the distance, like I mentioned. Um, but we are already halfway through the, this card, six fights left, and that's going to take us to the lightweight division for the last prelim fight. Really fun matchup here, and I do have a bet on this fight. We have Ignacio Bahamundes taking on Zhu Rong. Um, the odds for this one, Bahamundes minus 200, Zhu Rong plus 170. And I'll just go ahead and say it, the, the fighter I do have a bet on is the dog here, Zhu Rong at plus 220, I believe I got him at. Um, a 225 on FanDuel actually. Um, actually, no, that one's Bet MGM. Sorry about that. Um, but you know this line has come in a lot, so you know I definitely made a good bet already. Plus 225 to plus 170. The market is agreeing with me, and um, you know it should be just a really fun matchup. You got two uh, fun, exciting strikers. Bahamanda is definitely a volume striker coming off that you know incredible knockout, spinning back kick knockout, one of the best knockouts of all of 2021 over Roosevelt Roberts. Um, Zhu Rong coming off a dominant performance over Jenkins. He had a rough debut against Kazula Vargas, lost that fight pretty clearly. Uh, but Zhu Rong, I think, has some good potential. He's a young fighter coming out of China. I'd say probably one of the most promising prospects coming out of China right now. Um, I'd say the um, number one prospect you know Song Yudong not really a prospect at this point he's a pretty established contender but uh, Rong is actually a pretty good offensive grappler as well you don't really see many uh, Chinese fighters uh, being effective offensive grapplers but I did see some good things from him in the offensive grappling versus Jenkins uh, he's a, a dynamic striker as well got some power in that right hand of his very fast on the feet so I think the striking here uh, definitely has a slight edge to Bahamendez. Uh, he's probably the more diverse striker with his kicks. Uh, he throws a ton of volume, has really good cardio, but Rong has a, a powerful right hand. I think he's going to be able to, to hang in there on the feet. And if Rong comes in with the right game plan to mix into some takedowns to get that offensive grappling going, I mean, he could really steal this fight. I think it is pretty likely to go to the decision. And I think that uh, if these are some close rounds, Baja Mendez is landing a lot of strikes, but Rong uh, lands a big punch or two, ends with a late takedown, I think he could steal these rounds. And I think it's, we're headed for a close decision on either side for this fight. Um, so I like Zhu Rong as the underdog here. Um, and, you know, that's really all I have to say. I think... Uh, I think we're we're going to see a really fun fight between these two guys. Um, and I think that Rong will fight for your money at the odds. I mean, the, where the the price is now, it's getting closer to appropriate. But even now, I'd say there's some slight value left on Zhu Rong. Um, but if you haven't gotten in already, you probably have missed the the best prices on Rong. So don't don't just steam chase. Don't just pile in because everybody else is betting. Um, you know, make sure you really see some value at that, at that plus 170 price before you bet it. But um, really fun fight there. Uh, should be a, some good entertainment and we're gonna move on to the main card we got a five fight main card um kicking things off with a really fun matchup in the middleweight division we have robocop rodriguez as the slight favorite minus 155 taking on armin petrosian making his ufc debut fresh off a knockout in round one of the contender series and if you listen to the podcast you know me i'm always looking to kind of be very skeptical of these these contender series guys guys especially coming off of finishes because we know that dana white doesn't exactly look for the quality of a fighter he looks at if they can finish or not 
And when guys finish fights early, you know, sometimes the public overrates them. They think that they're better than they are. And that's exactly what Petrosian is coming off of, a first round knockout. But if you watch Petrosian's fights, this guy gets taken down and controlled against the cage, gets, you know, grinded out against the cage, gets held in a body lock for almost every single one of those fights. Um, the Now, I do have to say that he is pretty good at once he gets back to distance, he does know that he's down in the round. He knows he needs to spam volume, and he is pretty good at hurting his opponents once he breaks free of that clinch. But I mean, I've seen three or four of his fights where he was taken down, he gives up his back, he sits against the cage, he gets controlled for three or four minutes at a time, and then he breaks away, he throws a few strikes, and the guys get knocked out. So um, he does look like a, a decent kickboxer, nothing special at all. He does have some fast kicks from the outside, but in terms of his pocket boxing, if you watch the fight against Yusefel, I believe is the gentleman's name, I mean, one minute into that fight, they get in a, a, a back and forth boxing exchange in the pocket. Petrosian keeps his chin wide up in the air and he gets clocked and knocked out in one minute. And that was at 205. He is dropping down to the middleweight weight class for this one. He did weigh in at 201 pounds for his last fight, though, so it doesn't seem like he's going to be cutting a massive amount of weight um but you do have to consider that he is cutting that weight for the first time in about two and a half almost three years the first time making 185 so you got to think that that's going to take a toll um and getting over to the rodriguez side really love robocop i bet on him in uh, both of his ufc fights so far and his last fight was a bit sketchy against uh jun young park he showed some really good uh, grappling in round one of that fight was able to take park down got a back take but in round two he did get rocked he was in a real bad spot getting lit up with some punches but he had a miracle comeback where he was able to rock park in some boxing exchanges and put him out and you know he has had a bit of a susceptible chin at times he got knocked out by jordan williams uh he got hurt by park like i mentioned and he kind of has the same issue as petrosian where he just keeps his chin a little bit high in those exchanges um but if Rodriguez is not getting rocked, I mean, I do think he is the much better pocket boxer of the two, much more comfortable at boxing range. Um, Petrosian is definitely going to have the advantage with the kicks from the outside. But Rodriguez is not no slouch in the kicks at all. He does really good at checking leg kicks, one of a, a, a very rare thing you see in MMA. It's a basic skill, but very few fighters have it for some reason. But Rodriguez, you saw in that park fight, knows how to check kicks. He just All you got to do is turn your leg outside a little bit, and you shut down that leg kick, which is such a big weapon for so many fighters. And uh, so many fighters, for some reason, just don't learn how to check leg kicks. But uh, Rodriguez does have that skill. That is a good thing to think about in this fight. And I think Rodriguez has, you know, the, the boxing advantage. He definitely has the grappling advantage. He's got much more experience. He's much more experienced late in fights. And I think, you know, kind of all signs point to Rodriguez winning this fight. Unless he gets, you know, knocked out early on here, which is a small threat. I think that rounds two and three really favor Rodriguez here. I um, mean, he came in on short notice versus Jusko Todorovic and put up a nice three round, 15 uh, minute performance there. He rallied back from that, that, uh, getting rock versus park in his last fight so i think rodriguez uh, will know that the grappling is where this fight favors him uh and he has a good arsenal of takedowns you saw his transitions against jun young park too i mean the guy is slick on the mat he can hit takedowns judo throws he can take your back um you know he can do all types of things on the ground and i think he's a pretty slick operator on the mat and his submission price at plus 460 on FanDuel, i think is a really good bet I actually just locked in a bet on that and tracked it on my bet mma tips page uh right before this fight fight um i mean if you look at the odds rodriguez knockout is plus 185 and his submission is plus 460 i think you know i wouldn't say those lines should be completely flipped but i'm not really sure why his knockout is plus 185 here um i think that you know knockout is possible of course catching petrosian on the feet a positional tko on the floor is possible but i think rodriguez is going to be looking to, to get that takedown get a back take and get a rear naked choke on petrosian uh because Petrosian had just shown such uh, a susceptibility to getting taken out and give up his back and getting controlled against the cage. I think we're going to see a grappling clinic from Rodriguez here on his way to either a submission or a uh, he grappling heavy decision victory here. And if you like Petrosian, just take him by knockout, man. His odds for his money line plus 130 
when you can get plus 200 for his knockout. I mean, Petrosian subbing him is, you know, virtually impossible. That's why you see a plus 2,800 price tag next to it. And uh, Petrosian winning a decision seems awfully unlikely to me. If Petrosian is winning this fight, he's probably going to be landing hard. Uh, he's probably going to be looking for that knockout. So uh, Petrosian knockout at plus 200 is better than his money line if you are looking to bet him there. But uh, really fun fight. Uh, I think Petrosian could win UFC fights, but I mean, they're, they're matching him up against a tough fighter in Rodriguez here in his first fight. So I think that uh, Rodriguez will uh, grapple his way to a victory here. And that's going to take us to the next fight, which is in the lightweight division. We have Armand Sarugian taking on Joel Alvarez. Uh, Sarugian is the favorite here. Let me find these odds on uh, best fight odds. What's going on here? Are they not on here? Um, all right, I'm going to have to pull up these odds, uh, but I'll talk about the fight in the meantime. Um, let me just get these odds up here. Saruki in minus 220, Joel Alvarez plus 176. Um, so Joel Alvarez, you know, really shocked me in his last fight against Tiago Moises. I did not give him much of a chance to win that fight. And he just really went at Moises in that fight, uh, was able to hurt him with some knees, some punches, swarmed him with nonstop knees and elbows to get the finish and knocked out Moises in round one. Really shocking result there, but don't let that result confuse you too much um, because Alvarez before that, I mean, extremely flawed fighter, uh, you know, 95% of his wins came by way of submission. And the guy is really known for getting taken down, uh, laying in guard, going for su submissions like arm bars and triangles. And that can work against some lower level opponents. But when you're facing higher level guys, I mean, that's a really bad strategy for you to lay on your back for long periods of time to look for guard submissions. And he's facing, you know, a blue chip prospect in Armand Sarukian. Uh, again, like I was saying earlier, I don't even know if you could call him a prospect. He's a pretty established contender at this point. But Saryukin is a really skilled striker. You know, he's got solid boxing, uh, you know, beautiful jab. Uh, and then he's also a tremendous wrestler. You saw him wrestle multiple opponents in his UFC career. Um, OAM, he put up a good 15-minute uh, wrestling performance versus Matt Frivola. And, I mean, Matt Frivola is a solid wrestler. You know, he did really good in a lot of those wrestling exchanges. But Saryukin still got him down to the mat, you know, uh, 10 times officially according to the stats. But he kept him down for a uh, good stretches at times and he just showed that he can wrestle for 15 minutes he can mix in the striking really well and the guy is just you know a pretty phenomenal fighter i'm really looking forward to see where sarukin goes in his future um, but he should have the wrestling to take down Alvarez here. He should have the ability to avoid that arm bar, that, uh, that guillotine, the triangle, like the submissions that Alvarez like hitting them with. Um, and on the feet, you know, Armand should be, uh, you know, the better, more experienced slicker striker, you know, much better boxer, but Alvarez is going to have some big size advantage here. He's going to be eight inches taller, which is, you know, extremely significant. We're talking about, I think five, seven for Sarukian, pretty short for lightweight. And then Alvarez, 6'3", which is gigantic for lightweight. You know, this guy is, is, is pretty fucking huge. I think he's had some trouble making weight uh, in his past fights. Uh, let me let me check up on that. Yeah, he missed weight 157.5 versus Moises. Um, he missed weight versus Yakovlev 159.5. He did make weight versus Joe Duffy, and he did make it versus uh, Danilo Beloardo as well. But he missed weight in back-to-back -back fights. Um, and he is also very skewed towards round one. I believe, you know, again, 90% of his fights have ended in round one. I don't know if he's ever been to the decision. So the longer this fight goes, the more it's going to favor the more versatile, more experienced, better cardio fighter in Armand Sarukian. And, uh, you know, I think that Sarukian probably is going to cruise his way to a decision uh, victory here. He doesn't really chase that finish too, too often. Um, so I can see him being up pretty decisively in rounds two and three, but just not chasing that finish. Um, and he could have a bit of a tough round one, you know, with the size of Alvarez. Uh, if maybe if Alvarez comes out aggressive, throwing those long knees, those elbows, those straight punches like he did versus Moises, he could have some initial success here. Uh, but I don't see it happening, you know, very sustained. I think it's going to probably fall off a cliff pretty heavily in round one or after round one, excuse me. And then, uh, you know, Tsarukin is going to take over to either uh, a round two, three finish or a, you know, dominant, you know, 29, 27, 30, 26 type of decision for, for Armand here. So fun matchup, but I think uh, Armand probably has him covered everywhere. Um, and I'm looking to see where they go next with Armand. Um, 
maybe he can fight like the loser of the main event or something. Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, him and Islam already fought, so who knows? Um, maybe uh, Gamrot is next for Sarukian after this. Um, but that's enough said about that fight. I'm going to take a swig of water real quick. Been talking nonstop for 20 minutes straight. Oh, 30 minutes straight, actually. But we're burning through these fights. we got three fights left. The next fight is in the women's flyweight division. We have ji Yun Kim as the minus 161 favorite, taking on uh, Priscilla Cachoeira as the plus 141 dog. Uh, said it on Twitter a few days ago, but it is amazing that Pr Priscilla Cachoeira is getting another fight in the UFC. Uh, she was in a rear naked choke versus Jillian Robertson. She deliberately tried gouging her eyes out with her thumb two times, and the commentators mentioned it. You know, DC, Rogan, Anik, they all mentioned it. Um, so you got to think that if someone is blatantly trying to, to break the rules and gouge a fighter's eyes out with their fucking thumb, and they're still getting offered another fight in the UFC, it makes you think just how desperate is the UFC to to fill these slots right now just how desperate are they for female fighters uh to fill these divisions because you know pretty egregious foul committed by Cachoeira there but she's still getting another ufc fight but getting down to this matchup um i can't be laying over minus 150 on g on kim i mean she retreats the entire time she throws you know some decent straight punches i mean she is an okay boxer but you know she's she just doesn't know like the body language of winning fights. I mean, she could have possibly won that fight against Molly McCann if she didn't just retreat the entire time. I mean, her body language was so terrible there that she really, you know, let McCann steal that round three from her. Even though Ji Young Kim was lighting uh, Molly McCann up with punches that round as well, it's just uh, the aggressor, the aggression of Molly McCann really stole that round for her in the eyes of the judges. Um, and something similar could happen here. I mean, Cachoeira is, you know, a zombie, you know, extremely durable, has taken multiple beatings in her UFC career and kept fighting. And she's going to keep marching forward. She's going to be throwing those haymakers of hers, those uppercuts, those wild overhands. And, you know, skill-wise, Ji Yun Kim, much, much more skilled striker than Cachoeira. Much better fighter overall, but I'm still concerned for, for Kim to lose this fight, honestly, because uh, she's going to be backing up. You know, she's going to be throwing those punches, but they're not going to really deter Cachoeira. Kim has really no power in her punches, and she's going to be, you know, moving backwards, retreating, throwing straight punches. But Cachoeira will eat those punches. She'll keep coming forward. And eventually, I could see the pressure of Cachoeira kind of adding up. Maybe she catches Kim with some big punches at times. Um, and Cachoeira actually has knocked out a few women. She does have some decent power for the women's weight class. Um, so I, I could see a finish happening for Cachoeira here via knockout, honestly. Um, Kim does have a knockout victory in the UFC over Nadia Kassim, but uh, Kassim you know, is a weak, terrible fighter. Cachoeira, as I said, very proven durable, has taken beatings before and kept chugging along. And I think that uh, the Priscilla Cachoeira no scorecards prop is a pretty good bet here. That's available at plus 106 on FanDuel. Should be up on other books uh, you know, in the future. But uh, no scorecards means if this fight goes to the decision, your bet you, is void. You get your money back. If your fighter wins inside the distance, you win. If your fighter loses inside the distance, you lose. So I don't think that Kim has a great chance at finishing Cachoeira. And I think that if anyone is finishing this fight, it's probably going to be Cachoeira by knockout uh, with those big punches catching uh, Jeon Kim going backwards. So fight you really can't be confidently betting either money line side here but i just th don't think you especially can be betting ji Yun kim as a minus 160 favorite i mean i know it's catch where i know she's a zombie who walks forward and each pu eats punches with her face but you know that's not very different from molly mccann i mean kind of a similar matchup to molly mccann um and i could see you know catch winning the fight with her aggression in a similar fashion uh, in terms of bets for this one money line i think nothing really too appealing there uh, the Cachoeira knockout pop at plus 470 is not bad and as I mentioned the Cachoeira no scorecards prop, uh, prop at plus 105 is probably worth a, a small to medium bet as well because I think Cachoeira could possibly finish I don't see much of a finishing threat from Gion Kim here so um, enough said about that terrible fight let's move on to the co-main event I don't know how the fuck this is a co-main event but here we are um 
the UFC's co-main events on these fight nights have been, you know, just terrible. If you look at the four co-main events so far, just terrible fights after terrible fight. And this is another one. I mean, these guys aren't glaringly awful, but I just feel like the way they match up is just going to produce a terrible fight. And uh, that is Wellington Terman versus Misha Serkunov. Serkunov slight favorite, minus 115. Wellington Terman minus 105 on Bet Online right now. Honestly, thinking about this fight kind of gives me a headache. I don't really see much of a clear analysis or path to victory for either guy. I think it's most likely going to be headed to a sloppy split decision type of fight here. And both guys are pretty similar to one another, where they're both primarily grapplers. They're not really at their most comfortable uh, striking um, but they're both not, you know, glaringly awful on the feet either. I'd say Sirkunov is probably a little bit better of the striker, but he also is very fragile. He's not very aggressive. He's not very high volume. You saw that fight against um, Christoph Jocko in his middleweight debut. Just didn't really have enough aggression or output in that fight, although he did come very close to winning a split decision in that fight somehow. Um, Terman, same thing in his fight against Alvi. Just a close fight. Um, was really close going into that decision. Honestly, could have lost that fight with the point deductions there. But I thought that Terman showed, you know, pretty good initiative there. He he did a lot more, threw more strikes, and I think that that's what this fight could come down to: who is more aggression or aggressive, who is showing more initiative. Um, because I think these rounds are going to be close. I could see either guy hitting takedowns on one another. Although I do think that it's much more likely that Sirkunov is the one hitting takedowns. And I think if anyone is keeping top position here, it's definitely going to be Sirkunov. I think Sirkunov's jujitsu is a little bit better, and we did see Terman get stuck on bottom for uh, long periods of time against Carl Roberson who happens to be a terrible terrible grappler and I think the tournament is just a little bit too likely to accept guard accept bottom position while Sirkunov is more likely to hit sweeps get off his back if he does end up on bottom so I give a slight grappling advantage uh, to, to Sirkunov here uh, but I lean toward with the striking with the aggression with the you know obviously the youth is on uh, Terman's side and I'm gonna slightly side with Terman here at plus money but this is not a fight you can be confident in I would really tread lightly on the money line side here don't think either of these guys is really a guy you can trust with your money on them and uh, maybe the ghost the distance here uh, i think i was pretty surprised at that line plus 150 for this fight to go to go the distance i think that probably is the most valuable prop uh, to be made or the mo most valuable bet of any bet here to be made um, you know, these props are just kind of confusing numbers. Terman knockout plus 400. I think that's a pretty bad number. He hasn't knocked anybody out in six years. And that guy he did knock out was an 0 and 11 fighter. Uh, zero wins, 11 losses. So not sure he's going to be knocking anybody out. Although Sirkunov is pretty fragile. Um, so, you know, really gross fight. It's probably going to be a stinker. Uh, probably going to be a split decision with a lot of grappling, a lot of cage pushing, a lot of grinding against the fence, and just going to be a pretty bad fight. Don't see how anyone could be excited about that one, but I'll slightly lean with Terman by decision. And that's going to take us to the main event, which happens to be an incredible matchup thrown together on short notice. But, uh, you know, we got Bobby King Green here as the huge underdog, plus 600 on DraftKings right now. Islam Mahachev minus 900 as the favorite. And this fight is actually a 160-pound catchweight fight. Bobby Green, of course, fought just two weeks ago at UFC 271, defeated Nasrat Hackbrass, putting together, you know, a pretty masterful 30-27 dominant boxing performance in that fight. And, you know, he's coming off of back-to-back, uh, -back, you know, very dominant, flawless victories. Bobby Green finally getting some of the appreciation he deserves. And if you listen to the podcast often, you know that I'm a big fan of Bobby Green, have been, you know, singing him praises for the past couple years, especially since the pandemic. He's really, you know, been more active, fighting a lot better, winning fights left and right. And he's been a money train and, you know, very grateful for the guy. I mean, he's definitely has a tough matchup in front of him here. Um, probably one of the worst matchups uh at lightweight for him right now in Islam Mahachev, who is just, you know, a phenomenal grappler. You got to give the guy credit. Um, he doesn't have the most exciting fights. Um, he is kind of a copy of Khabib at times, uh, has the very, very similar fighting style. Um, you know, personality wise is all the similar to Khabib. So he gets a little bit of, of hate for that. He gets a little bit of undeserved hate, honestly, but you got to give the guy credit. Like I said, <clears throat> just a phenomenal grappler and you know as good as it gets tremendous wrestler tremendous top pressure risk control submission games i mean he can attack submissions from top side control like he did versus dan hooker with that that americana or whatever it was um 
he can get arm triangles like he did on uh, Drew Dober. He can get arm bars like he did on Cajun Johnson. Uh, rear naked chokes like he did on Tiago Moises. I mean, the dude has a massive arsenal of submissions from all angles, uh, off his back, side control, top con- uh, full mount on the back. I mean, he can really attack from all positions. So it's an extremely dangerous fight for Bobby Green. Um, but I think it's also uh, not a terrible matchup for Bobby Green. I think that Bobby actually has some some aspects that give uh, Islam Mahachev some good problems here. And starting things off is uh, the boxing, the back foot boxing, I'll call it. Uh, Bobby Green, very comfortable moving backwards, outboxing guys while moving backwards. And that's a huge thing is so many guys are scared of Islam's uh, wrestling. So they think, oh, I'm going to pressure him. Dan Hooker was trying to pressure him, but he threw a naked leg kick and got taken down in 30 seconds. So it's really hard to pressure Islam um, and then that means that a fighter who is comfortable on the back foot is probably the better option uh, instead of pressuring because when you're like I said if you watch that Dan Hooker fight I mean he is just so aggressive he's moving forward he's coming in with the same aggression and Islam times it he catches that leg kick and he gets him down really easily so I think the aggression kind of just leans into the wrestling of Islam so fighting a more you know patient back foot type of fight is a better strategy to beat a fighter like Islam Mahachev and that's a role that Bobby's comfortable in you know he keeps his hands very low um you know that's good for this matchup because they'll be by his waist if he has to defend a takedown and his hand speed is just tremendous I mean his hands come from his waist to punching his opponent in the face you know at lightning speed he's got some of the best hand speed in in all of the UFC honestly and then now let's get, let's get over to Bobby's defensive grappling. And I think the guy is, you know, one of the most experienced defensive grapplers of anybody in the UFC. I mean, you can look at several of his fights, you know, half a dozen of his fights that involved guys trying to take him down, him defending those takedowns, him getting taken down, but getting back off of his back. He can hit switches. He can hit sweeps. He can get in top position himself. He's a really good grappler. And, you know, for example, the, the Volkman fight, the Eric Koch fight, Clay Guida, Lando Venata, Alan Patrick, Tiago Moises, Clay Guida, all those guys, uh, I, I, I named Guida twice, but, um, all those guys attempted to take uh, Bobby Green down, and there's a lot of footage of Bobby Green defending takedowns out there. And I think you know it's fair to say that the guy is a very good defensive grappler. I mean, he's not um, impenetrable. He's not going to not get taken down at all in this fight. But he's comfortable getting taken down, and working his way back up to the feet. And I don't think that Islam uh, is going to present anything you know completely new to to Bobby Green here now. If the fight gets down to the floor, I think that Islam is going to have much better top control than the guys I mentioned, you know, with the way he controls the wrists and the leg lacing. I mean, he's just uh, incredible at the way he keeps opponents down. Uh, But a lot of his fights are also extremely one-sided. When he fought Drew Dover, Thiago Moises, he fought these guys who aren't really good at getting off their back, who are kind of known for once they get taken down, they're known for staying on their back for long periods of time. Bobby Green is not that type of guy, and he's going to be working his way back up to the feet. He's going to be, um, you know, maybe giving up some bad positions at times, but he's going to be attempting to get back to the feet, and he has very good technique at in terms of getting off of his back. So Islam's going to be working harder than he did in those past few uh, of his fights, especially the fights that got late. Like I mentioned, the Trudeau fight, the Tsarukian fight, the Moises fight. Um, I think he's going to be working a lot harder in this fight than he did in those fights. I think it's going to look more similar to the Tsarukian fight, if anything, where Tsarukian was able to escape some of those bottom positions. Um, And... You know, Bobby Green is going to get taken down here. I do think he's going to spend some time on on bottom, but I think he's going to stay safe. He's not going to get up too recklessly. He's not going to, you know, give up his back and get submitted right away. I think he's going to, you know, intelligently work his way back up to the feet. And when he can, you know, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what Islam's gas tank looks like if he's able to escape a few of those takedowns. Um, We're going to see what Islam is really made of if a guy is in a tough fight uh, and, you know, giving them some some problems we're going to see can islam battle back from that adversity we really haven't seen islam battle much or any adversity in his ufc career at all and i think bobby has a lot of tools to to make this fight difficult for him that back foot boxing that that defensive grappling pedigree you know the vast amount of experience that he has bobby's got good cardio good output um you know he just landed almost 200 strikes against nasrat in his last fight over three rounds um you do have to have a little bit of concern over bobby with the weight cut he is uh, cutting uh, weight back-to-back weeks but um, well actually he had one week in between 
two weight cuts within two weeks and he is getting an extra five pounds to kind of alleviate some of that pressure but it's still going to be tough for Bobby to to cut that weight and he was in a 15 minute fight just uh less than you know or it was 12 days ago uh, he was in a 15 minute fight it was pretty one-sided he did not take much damage in that fight but you know still your your body peaks out at a certain point if you're in training camp you can train for too long at times and your body isn't going to be in peak condition for the fight it is a bit of a question what kind of shape Bobby's going to show up in here but he looked phenomenal just two weeks ago. I think there's good reason to believe that he's going to show up in top form again. And I think he's going to give Islam, you know, his toughest fight that he's had in a while. And, you know, I'm not going to go out and say I'm confidently picking Bobby Green here as the plus 600 underdog, but I think he's certainly going to fight for your money at plus 550, at plus 600. I think you really can't go wrong with a, a one unit bet on Bobby Green money line here. And in terms of some other, other props for the fight, um, looking at FanDuel, um, they have Islam round one, two, or three at minus 160 odds, and his four or five decision line is actually plus 180. At those odds, I much more so lean to Islam four or five decision. I don't think he's going to get uh, Bobby out of there and submit him early. I mean, it took Islam uh, 11 or 12 minutes to submit Drew Dober, who is, you know, and I love Drew Dober, but he's a pretty terrible defensive wrestler, not good off of his back at all. And it still took Islam, you know, 11 or 12 minutes to get that fight out. Um, it, Tiago Moises, he was dominating Moises in that fight, had 13, 14 minutes of top control. And it still took him to the fourth round to finally submit uh, Moises in that fight. So I think it's a really good chance this fight does see four or five decision. I think if I had a you know a gun to my head official prediction, it would be Islam by decision, probably like a 49-46 decision. But um, you know, really hoping Bobby Green can pull off something miraculous here. A short notice main event. He really deserves his main event spot, and it would just be, you know, uh, a Cinderella story if he was able to pull off this upset. And the last thing I'll say is another prop I like for this fight that I do plan on betting is the starts round three prop at minus one twenty two. Um, the same thing I was just saying about Drew Dober. If Drew Dober can last 11 or 12 minutes, I think Bobby Green should be able to as well. And it only has to last 10 minutes for you to start that bet or to catch that bet. So starts round three, minus 122 on FanDuel, also available on DraftKings. I think that's a pretty good bet. Um, that'll be my most confident prediction of the fight is this fight will start round three minus 122 that is a good bet to be made and uh you know hopefully bobby can pull off something miraculous here you know i love bobby green uh i'm a fan of of islam you know i think you have to give him the respect that he deserves for being the phenomenal grappler he is but um you know he's untested he hasn't faced much adversity he does have um some susceptibilities of his own so i'm hoping bobby can exploit those and make this a competitive fight and you know possibly even pull off that crazy upset as the plus 600 underdog so uh, that is going to do it for this fight of this entire card uh, the bets i have locked in so far one unit on bobby green zoo wrong and carlos hernandez and a small bet on uh, rodriguez by submission as well make sure you're following me on bet mma tips uh, to find all my official predictions and official bets and uh, that's going to do it for this podcast hope you all enjoyed this solo edition podcast um Ozzy will be back with us next week before UFC 272. Um, so hope you're all able to enjoy this podcast, get some good information from it, and uh, hope to all see you uh, to see you all before the next podcast next week. UFC 272, Colby versus Masvidal. That should be a really fun card. So hope you're able to win some bets, enjoy the fights this weekend, and I'll see you all next week. Peace.